Oh, thank you, Chris, for taking part in the interview today. Um, I think we should begin where your interests in film and photography developed and perhaps mm. your first experiences with colour photography, perhaps as an amateur in your early life. Mm. Um, well, I, I always had a box brownie, so I was a keen photographer, even as when very young. But my first um, real experience and learning was when I was, I left school and when I was about 16 I got a job with uh, an American filmmaker called Alan Forbes. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan made documentary films, he was in London and he taught me about editing and about camera operating and about sound and basically was a very committed filmmaker and God I was lucky to uh, to to work with somebody who was so inspirational and cared so much about his art and his craft and telling stories. So I was a lucky man, very lucky. Mm -hmm. I could have ended up working for a bully or somebody who could, didn't really care, but my passion for the cinema as a kid <clears throat> and his teaching uh, held me together and inspired me. So it was a lucky start. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps we could talk a little bit about um, your first experiences with mm. colour photography and maybe the comparison to uh, black and white filming. Mm. What it, were your... all, all the films that Alan made were in black and white. Uh, yeah. There was a 35 mil film called No Governors about street entertainers in London. And that followed... Um, Dennis Mitchell's uh, way of filmmaking, which is Dennis would record a lot of pictures and then lay a lot of wild track voiceover on the on on the film, and that's how we made the the first film, which was thirty five mil with Alan. It was uh, I think for nearly half a year we went every night to a cafe to record wild tracks, mm. um, having shot the film to lay over the pictures. Then <clears throat> we had the idea to make a film uh, in black and white on 16mm uh, about Padre Borelli in Naples. And uh, Borelli had uh, um, start, started an orphanage uh, after the Second World War for kids who had lost their parents. And we made, we made that film. And then we made the second March to Order Marston film about nuclear disarmament, the March in Britain. Um, that was with Carol Rice and... Um, and we made, basically we made several documentaries in, uh, in black and white on 35 mil and 16 mil. Mm -hmm. And Alan used to get me to operate and, and I, it was a learning process but he was a great teacher. Great. Um, so going back slightly, did you ever have any experience with using um, sort of amateur gauge colour stocks like Kodachrome or... No, it was, I started off shooting black and white with a box brownie and, yeah. and Alan was the person who taught me mm -hmm. how to work an Arriflex and a Bolex, right. and, but they were all in black and white. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when you were moving away from black and white filming, mm. what, was, what was that change like moving into colour um, in terms of your approach? I think the f first experience, because our, I, I worked for World in Action doing current affairs, mm. and that was all black and white. Colour didn't really become uh, an issue till mid-60s. Um, my first experience with, with colour was actually quite uh, difficult because um, it, we were using reversal colour stock and the, uh, um, the latitude is, is really quite, um, was quite um, limited which made shooting cinema verite style in uh, reversal quite difficult um, because you had to have a lot of 
consideration of contrast and, and lighting ratios. And that's the uh, really cinema verite is about catching the moment. It's not about being perfectly, um, uh, getting a perfect exposure. Um, and probably that's why the early cinema ver verite films were all shot, if they were lit at all, were shot with bounce light to try and get an even exposure so the reverse of film could deal with that problem. Of course, it changed when they got negative. Um, so you've mentioned before that um, there is a uniqueness and honesty in mm -hmm. the natural light which mm -hmm. is captured by documentary. Um, would you say that was as effective during the move to colour using those reversal stocks? Or was there something more well, difficult in trying to capture? Um, in a funny way, black and white is more obstinate than colour because black and white, you need to find tone and you, you have to have a good tone. Um, if you don't, you, you lose the image and the, the colour um, stock will record a colour so you don't have that tonal problem. Um, so it's different, but um, I don't know what, what what can you try the question well, again? So I guess um, in those early years of uh, perhaps Eastman colour and the reversal stocks, obviously they improved throughout the sixties and seventies. Would you say you would have had a preference for black and white, perhaps in those? I think um, days? really. Probably that's the, the way I wouldn't look at it. The way I would think is that um, really it's about the writing and the story and what you're trying to say. So if the story could come first, I think you'll find that, that um, the inspiration for good photography um, comes from within the writing. And um, it's surprising how many directors you'll work for who haven't the faintest idea really how to photograph a film. But if you're inspired by, by the writing and the ideas and the story and possibly the acting, um, I think um, the solutions to technical problems become um, second nature. So some films are enriched by being in colour, like say, um, I did a film with Ken Loach called Black Jack um, which, which, which was in colour and it had its own problems because we had a very small budget but, but um, that film is definitely um, a, a, a more powerfully told story in colour. Another film like Looks and Smiles was shot in black and white and I think colour would have been in distraction. Um, when we shot Kess uh, the stipulation from the studio was that it was shot in colour and the way we dealt with that was we um, told, I told Tony Garnett, the producer, that I wanted to pre-flush all the negative before we went into production and Tony um, uh, being a, a, a sort of a creative producer and not a negative kind of producer said that's fine but of course he never realized the huge risk he was taking if the lab had messed up the pre-fogging, pre uh, pre-flushing and um, so we pre-flushed the whole of the negative before we shot it which is actually almost unheard of. People um, pre-flush the, the print but not the neg. But that enabled us to shoot um, a really tough st story uh, and, and help the colour uh, not dominate the, the film because the colour can always distract from the, the, the heart of a story. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, Roberto Rossellini's films in the Italian New Wave, to me, they could never have been in colour. They, they are powerful because of their black and white photography. 
but I think, as I said earlier, I think uh, uh, it, it's the um, the story has to, in a way, dictate um, uh, how how whether the sh it should be shot in colour or black or white, and how you might light a scene and how you might uh, um, aesthetically think about a scene. Mm -hmm. So, um, just to reiterate that point, they were the considerations. You would look at the story first, perhaps, mm -hmm. and have. Would you have a discussion with the director or the producer? I mean, the thing is, um, uh, you choose a story because of the writing, mm -hmm. and um, then, and then once you say, "I'm into this," then of course you're in a collaboration with, with the director, a producer, with the designer, with the costume designer, with everybody, with the writer, with the actors. And you're trying to find a balance through all of these different uh, talents to make a great film. And um, so yes, it would be obviously in collaboration. You can't uh, be an island on your own. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now during this period, we were talking about I guess it's around the time of Kez, um, there was a push to all colour production and mm. by the end of the 60s almost all of British features were, were shot in colour. Do you, from your experience, was there kind of, was there ever a push back from that? You know, mentioning Kez, you were kind of um, the, the pre-flashing um, to ensure that the colour didn't dominate the story. Do you think there was ever an attempt to kind of create a, an image, uh, almost a kind of, um, uh, that had a black and white look, but it was in colour, yeah. did that? Um, uh, the, the film I did before Kess was, I uh, was Bram Probrin's um, operator on Paul Cow, And um, the thing about Paul Cow was that, that <coughs> Ken obviously, bef before that he'd worked with Tony Emi on um, um, Kathy Come Home, which was in black and white, which was a marvellous film. Then he did Paul Cow with Brown Brogren. And he was obviously very concerned, like Brown was, that the, the Eastman colour negative would uh, dominate the, the story, would um, kind of punch holes in the story in its brilliance, in its cleverness, in its, its uh, variety of colour. And the way Brown tried to deal with that was um, he still had the, the movie lights in in the room on the set with the actors. Mm -hmm. But on just before takeover, he would get talcum powder and he would scatter it in front of the lights to try and soften the light. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, aside from it being carcinogenic, um, basically after three takes, the whole set would be covered in white. It, it didn't really work very well. so. When Ken asked me to do um, Kess, we we decided to work, find a new a new and try and make a new way to to, to approach the work. Um, so we flashed all the neg, not the print. We made a new kind of dis decision between us. Um, which was in collaboration completely, that we would keep all the movie lights off the set, that we would not have any lights in the room, and that we would never break the circle of the, of the acting. We would always be outside the circle of the performance. So that, of course, in its very nature meant that we were on longer lenses. Mm -hmm. And the stop was incredibly slow. It was 100 ASA um, tungsten and um, um, the stock was very slow at 100 ASA, so it was not an easy thing to achieve. Mm. Um, but that, that, that's what we did. Yeah. Um, talking about those techniques in those early years that you were using Eastman Colour, was there anything else you would use, any other devices to try and, um, you know, we hear about people putting particular gauzes over the mm. lens to... Um, I kind of, um, I had Dior stockings and all those things, but I actually uh, felt in a way they were slightly fake and false, and I was trying to um, 
make an image that was believable. Um, so that, that to to us, I think that would be a false false step. It would take the audience away from what you're trying to capture, which is the words, mm. like the sound is as important as the image, what they're saying matters. If you put a gauze in front, somehow it's a distraction. Mm. So you like to kind of keep as much of what is happening in front of the camera and transfer that to the negative. You, you'd like to keep as much yeah. of that real. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, uh, in, in the documentaries that I shot, um, one had learned, um, I, I never carried lights, I shot um, 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 I, I always worked with natural light because the, the, um, the, the uh, subtlety and uh, the huge range of, of different colour temperatures and and diff different, uh, the blue or the green or the yellow or the white, mm -hmm. a huge range of colour that God would create by the sun bouncing off, say, green grass, you get green. Mm -hmm. The sky is blue, you see the tinge of the blue. And I, I remember uh, as an assistant working with DPs who would always go to a location and black everything out. And I always thought, well, they, they're never, never going to be as clever as God. Mm -hmm. They can never create the amazing light. Um, uh, when um, Darius Kanji was shooting uh, Evita for, for Alan Parker, um, um, I asked the operator, Mike Roberts, I said, how was it uh, Alan Parker working with Darius Conji on Evita? And he said, well, Alan said, well, let's see what the frog does. And um, this is day one, and they're shooting in a, in, in, in a big kind of butchers, and, uh, which had been converted into a set. And uh, they all took their time setting up on day one and uh, Mike set up the camera, Alan did his bit with the actors, and then suddenly Darius said, ready, and like they'd only been there half an hour, and uh, they were all gobsmacked, and what Darius had done, is, which any sensible person would really do, he'd been there the day before, he checked the time of day, the length, how long the scene was, and he took a gamble, and he knew that at 7.30, the sun would be there and it would stay with him and he could match it till about one o'clock. Mm -hmm. So at 7.30 he said, turn over. And they were gobsmacked that, that he would take that risk. Mm -hmm. But that's the way to go, mm -hmm. taking risks. I was just about to say, was that, you know, is that your kind of philosophy as well? That Oh, I would yeah. always do that. Yeah. I would always try and work with a natural light. Mm -hmm. um, in what instance would you perhaps use um, artificial lighting and perhaps would you ever use colour filters at all to try and... Um... Um, when, if you're losing the light or you lose the light, if a cloud comes, then yeah, I would use a big, an arc, uh, a brute or 18k, and then I would filter it <coughs> to try and match the light that I just lost. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I wouldn't, I would use lights, but I would use lights to, to so I could stay in continuity. Mm -hmm. And would the same apply for coloured filters? You wouldn't, you, you wouldn't use them to kind of enhance the image, you would do it to I, I used to, in documentaries, I used to use um, an Aero 5, a yellow filter, in, when I was shooting colour sometimes, and I would use corals. Um, and I would use uh, Harrison Blues, and I, uh, emotionally, depending on where the story was at, I, I might induce um, the negative one way or another. Um, um, so yes, I think, like we were talking about, the story is everything, 
the mood of the photography and the lighting comes from what you read and how it affects you. And, and then off you go and do your thing and hope that everybody likes what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So you might use filters yeah. to change things. Okay. Um, could you talk a little bit perhaps about your experience with um, Eastman Colour itself? You know, you were talking before about some of those earlier stocks uh, mm. with the lower ASA. Mm. Did it ever get to a point where you, you were more satisfied with uh, the colour reproduction, the, a more natural sort of look to the film? Or you, were you always trying to enhance that at all, the negative? Um, I think I was always trying to, I was always trying to make Eastman colour neg uh, more, I'm going to use the word subtle, uh, more gentle, more, less in your face. I was always trying to do that, um, and as I said, Brian Probin did that with talcum powder, um, and we did it by pre-flashing, so I was always working, um, like if, when lighting, it would of, often be a question of using negative light rather than positive light. Um, um, but again, it's a question of observing what you see in, in real situations, and, and it's a great teacher. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, sort of talking about East McCullough still, as we're moving sort of into the, the late 70s when the stocks were becoming much faster, mm. um, do you feel that there was less that you had to do to achieve the look you wanted? when you put the negative in the camera, were you generally satisfied that you would get a better look? Think about probably in the 60s, they, were, they had stronger blues in the Eastman colour, even yeah. though they were, they were kind of, um, the, the colours were much but, stronger. But I mean, uh, when you have a close relationship with the grader um, and the lab, um, you can almost fix any problem. You can't, there's certain problems you can't fix, like, Cyan and magenta can be problems, mm. um, but on the whole, you can almost fix any problem with w working with a lab. The big problem that you can't solve is um, speed. So I used to send my uh, m my sixteen mil color neg to Chemtone in New York, and they 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 had a boosting system and. Fortunately, ATV allowed me to send my brushes to New York to be processed, so I could push push my neck at least to stop. And then uh, one of the lenses I used a lot was a 0.95 Ingenue, which of course is two stops faster than the standard lens. So I was basically getting, um, even in the mid 60s, I was. When did the 500 stock come out? I think it was... 93? Mm, probably, yeah. yeah. But I, 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 by using Chemtone process in New York and by, by using the Orange New 0.95 lens, I was able to um, uh, shoot in almost any circumstances. Mm. Um, that's the, it was always my issue was enough light for an exposure. That was my number one concern. Mm -hmm. um, whether I was on the back of a fire engine in Chicago or with the LAPD or anywhere in the, in the jungle in Burma was having enough exposure. Yeah. So that was my issue and that's how I dealt with it, by getting it processed in New York or by using an Orange New 0.95. Mm -hmm. Lens. And um, you, you mentioned the labs there. What about the labs in, in the UK? Did you have a particular relationship? Um, mm. There were two labs I worked with yeah. a lot. And um, one of the people I enjoyed most of all was a man called John Ensby, who was at Technicolor. Um, and then David Hemmings at Case. Um, 
yeah, the, that relationship was incredibly important. As important as, as dealing with, uh, as working with the art department and the costume department mm -hmm. and the schedule. Um, I suppose equally important is, in, is scheduling of a film to make sure that um, the light works for the story and is serving the actors. Um, sorry, can I say just be careful with the mic? Um, I'm banging it. No, just yeah. a little bit there. Yeah, just sorry. Just sorry. once. Thanks. It's, yeah, so let's go back to that, Chris. The relationship you had with Kay's and Technicolor, um, did you have much say in which lab processed your work? Um, maybe thinking about the features, or was mm. that largely determined by the producer? I always used to work with Technicolor, but then on, I remember on Local Hero, uh, David Putnam saying we had to use an English lab. So we went to K's, but most of my relationship was with with um, Technicolor. Um, so thinking about working with the grader, I know you said before that you like to keep the essence of the negative. Mm. Can you talk a bit about that process of working with the grader and ensuring that that um, that image was maintained right through mm. processing to printing? How much? Did you um, have that? I think the biggest problem uh, is always that the director spends a long time in the cutting room with the dailies, with the rushes, and he gets used to it looking in a certain way. Now, if those dailies weren't printed exactly as you, as the DP, wanted, you might then have a problem mm -hmm. um, with the director thinking you're changing his film. But on the whole, uh, um, if you care, if you worry about it and care about it from the word go, you, it's going to be a good collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, if you know which battles to fight. Yeah. Mm. Um, and thinking about the, the final prints of mm. the film, how involved were you at that stage? Because we have always, yeah. um, and and largely, I always achieve what I set out to achieve. I remember on The Reader that was one of the films that was a bit odd. I'd shot the, the, um, um, the love scenes between David and Kate. Um, uh, I shot the scenes where well, the love scenes, they, they were naked and I always shot the scene I shot the scenes um, w where their nakedness was minimal in visually, I kept them in shadow. But when it came to the grading, um, uh, Stephen Daudry wanted the bodies brighter. So he absolutely insisted, and I fought him, but I lost, to create a, um, a field over the areas of the body so he could print it lighter, mm -hmm. which seemed to me the mis miscommunication mm -hmm. because I wanted the nakedness to be minimal mm -hmm. and he wanted it much more. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I would say, uh, do your job and yeah. they'll be happy. Mm -hmm. um, Thinking about Technicolor, obviously Ambition printing ended in the UK in the mid 70s. Were any of your films um, released using IB prints at all? I'm not sure. No. Yeah, just thinking about um, if there are any differences between the labs that were um, printing your films, if you had a preference, if they went through Technicolor or um, Rank. For their final release print, but I guess there was always some of that, and and uh, and often you weren't told. But but I would go whoever processed an egg, I I would go through to the final print. What happened after then? You can't tell, can you? I mean, it's like DVDs. You may have graded the original film, but they're not going to invite you to grade the DVD. Mm -hmm. um, and what's Good about Kess is that at Criterion, when we did Kess for the American market, 
not only did we manage to restore the original soundtrack, which on release, um, Kess was considered un not really intelligible, so that they made us dub a lot of it. Mm. On the Criterion release, we we repaired the negative, we made a new negative, we managed to get the original soundtrack and um, we managed to grade it so that it, the Criterion copy looks magnificent. Mm -hmm. If you compare it with the copy that whoever releases it in Britain, it's crap. Mm -hmm. It's Criterion one is brilliant. Um, it was something I was gonna ask you about later on actually, Chris. What have your experiences been working with um, uh, Blu-rays and re-releases of your mm. films? Have you been able to kind of think back to when you made it and kind of... Yes, I, I mean, I keep, uh, I keep all, I've kept all my scripts and I've kept all my notes, so I know where, where to go. But Kess is the only film that I've, I've actually uh, signed off on the, the grading. I mean, even Michael Collins, I didn't do the final grade of that mm -hmm. on the DVD, mm. uh, on the Blu-ray. Yeah. I think the, the distribution companies think they know best and they also think it's going to cost money and it caused delays. Well, it doesn't cost money and it doesn't cause delays and they don't know best. Mm. So... Yeah. And, you know, that's been a topic we've been uh, discussing during our project, mm. this issue of these films being released digitally um, with a different approach. You know, a, a lot of these companies are looking for the best image, but that's based on their opinion of what the best image is. Um, if you, what are your feelings on that? That's, I know, feel that the person, whoever it is who made <coughs> the original commitments, will be the only person who knows what it should look like. Mm -hmm. Nobody else knows. Directors definitely don't know. Yeah. Do you ever see that sometimes when you watch your films on, uh, when you see them on television, do you ever kind of have a moment where it's, it's not being graded correctly for yes. broadcast? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But that, that's interesting because, um, you know, thinking back to, it's very difficult to see some of those original film prints again, and you know a lot of them have faded over the years. Um, mm. So you know these are the best versions available, mm. but they're still not quite capturing that original look of the film, mm. are they? That's, mm. yeah. it's true. Yeah. Um, there was something else I wanted to touch on when we were talking about color and natural mm. lighting. Um, in the past, you've you've mentioned that. Uh, moonlight as being a blue colour and mm. watching Walter again recently um, I noticed that we see that in a number of your films and I was wondering is that a particularly important colour in your filmmaking because I've noticed it several times now mm. sort of in evening scenes we see that that soft mm. blue light and casts across mm. uh, the scene. Well it should be more green oh. I never quite got it right yeah. um, should have more green in it yeah. Uh, would you say, is, is there any other kind of uh, um, colours that you've kind of always gone towards in your filmmaking? Are there any? I think, I, I honestly think that um, colour is dictated by, by, by script and by words mm -hmm. and by your emotional um, uh, development with the story. Mm -hmm. um, I really do. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about your relationship um, with the labs. How closely did you work with uh, the costume department and uh, the art department? Did you start before filming? Did you have much of a relationship? Well, on, on films, I always, I, I always try and get involved in the costume and the, and the art department. And the design department, because uh, it's going to affect what 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 you do as a DP, and also it's it, it um, it's a part of the emotional journey, and um, uh, 
that there needs to be a good collaboration to make something work. It's not, you're not doing it on your own. Mm. So uh, the, the lighting design and the costume design um, and the, the design of the sets are all crucial to the, the, the whole working. So yes, I get involved from, from as early as possible. And would you say that you let their designs influence your approach, or would you kind of um, have your own say into the work that they're doing? Well, I together? always have my own say, yeah. um, but but I'm, I'm, I, I try to be always uh, able to see a better idea than my own. Mm -hmm. I'm a magpie. Yeah. I will steal a better idea. Um, actually, on that point, uh, we've talked about some of your earlier influences. Mm. Has there been any uh, people working within the period of your career mm. that you've looked towards as you know been an inspiration to your work? Is there oh, I think definitely the design on Michael Collins, um, Tony Pratt. Mm. I think the design on on the mission, Stuart Craig, and I think. Uh, the design on killing fields, they, they were all completely inspirational. And I'm quite sure that the photography was hugely better because of those men's talents. Mm -hmm. um, and they're truly great designers. Yes. I'm fortunate to have worked with them. Mm -hmm. And there have been designers who I've uh, really not enjoyed working with at all and I've been a real pain in the butt but on the whole there have been some great designers I've enjoyed. Um, so if we um, can move on to talking about some of the specific films that you've worked on in your career, you've already talked about working with Brian Probin on mm. uh, Paul Cow. Um, was that one of your first experiences uh, working with colour on a feature? Was that the actual first? Probably. Yeah. So w if you could talk us through that, that experience of moving from black and white to colour on a feature, was, was there anything different? Did it feel different? Um, um, well, one felt that there was a lot more light on the set mm. and... Um, and there was more generators and more cable and more sparks mm. and um, and everything was a little bit more uh, um, larger um, and I think that was partly the way we worked I think later on on for instance guess we worked out how to deal with that mm -hmm. um, um, yes, so obviously c colour does have needs. And you, you mentioned before about um, trying to limit um, the amount of colour in those films. Mm. How did you see Paul Cow and Kez in relation to other films of that period, um, thinking about 66, 67? Can you name a, some of those films? Well, if we think about films like Modesty Blaze or mm. you know these really vibrant 60s mm films, very contrasty. But that's not kitchen sink, is it? No. no. So, I mean, Kess had to reflect what Barry had written. It was hardly modesty blaze. No. So it, it was, um, it, it was subdued in the way that the, the, the life of that kid in Barnsley was subdued, mm -hmm. except when he came into contact with the Kestrel. Um, so we served Barry Hines is writing by making it subdued and, and flashing the, the neck. And um, everything about the costume and the design was to make it as real as possible and not a fantasy. Um, so, how are we doing? Yeah, we've got 17 on these cards, uh, so another 10 minutes, then we'll change cards. So if we can talk about working on Lindy's, Lindsay Anderson's If, because mm. um, you talk us a bit about your experience on that film, mm. um, perhaps 
in relation to um, the black and white and the mm. colour and shooting? Um, so, if was a really important film for me because it came just before Kess and the film I'd been doing before that, I was in the Amazon with Adrian Cull, with the Karina Karari and um, Orlando and Claudius Filis Boas. So I came in, in into Cheltenham on to IF right from the Amazon and then the next thing I was going to work and I knew I was going to work on was Kess. So Miroslav Andrzejczyk is, um, is a great DP with shot the, the fabulous films of Milos Forman and The White Bus for Lindsay Anderson too. Um, um, Miroslav's films had nearly all been in black and white. Um, but when I was phoned up and asked to be his assistant, it was a, an exciting moment because he was one of the DPs that I really respected and could learn a lot from. Um, so the film was, sh was shot on the, um, the same negative we used on case, which is 100 ASA. And um, the pro problem that um, we had with some of the locations were huge. Mm -hmm. And Miroslav said it would be impossible on his budget to light them. And so Lindsay said, well, then we'll shoot it in black and white. And I said to Lindsay uh, on the, one of the scouts, I said, won't that be weird? You suddenly cut to black and white scene. What are the critics going to make of it? And he said, oh, don't be ridiculous. They think it's art. So that's what happened. We shot those scenes in black and white because we couldn't afford to do them in color. In a funny way, it became, um, it almost added tension to the film and it certainly caused uh, the critics a, 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 a few raised eyebrows. So in a funny way, it became controversial when in fact it was just to shoot it in colour would be too many lamps. Mm -hmm. So it was as simple as that, really. Mm -hmm. um, it was for me a great experience because I learned about thousand lamp journeys and I learned about a multitude of sparks and I learned you know, Miroslav had me organise things for him the way he wanted it. So I was learning very fast and I could take all that help he gave me, inspiration he gave me and, and um, to Kess. So uh, for both Ken Loach and myself, it, w it was a great experience, important experience. Yeah, that's wrong. Um, so we'll continue talking about some specific films and directors that you've worked with. Um, if we start off with, um, we've talked a little bit about Kez already, but perhaps talk a bit more about that relationship with you and Ken Loach, kind of your approach to using colour through the various films you've made with Ken over mm. the, particularly during the 1970s, mm. um, kind of your assumptions that you perhaps you developed together mm. around the use of colour. Mm. Well, the, the film we made after Kess was uh, after A Lifetime by Neville Smith, set in Liverpool. Um, and that was a colour film. Uh, and it was in colour because it was made for uh, London Weekend Television. Um, and that was, they, need, they needed, because of their licence and because of their commercial needs, they needed it in colour. It was produced by Tony Garnett. It's a, a beautiful script by Neville Smith. Um, again, we tried to slightly subvert the colour by using grey tones, and I think we even went as far as to use a bit of smoke, a bit of atmosphere. Um, and I definitely remember using a, a, a light Harrison fog, again, to try and desaturate the colour. Um, and it was a winter story and a very a sad story of a funeral and the relationship of the family. Um, it was uh, it was also quite a difficult shoot. I remember shooting, grabbing shots when the funeral uh, car came to the house, and there were people, real 
real people in the street looking out the windows at, at us filming and and I would grab shots in a kind of Ken Loach style and got into terrible trouble with the London Weekend continuity girl who said if you do any more shots I will, like that I will report you. And I'm going, well, so it was made under a, a fair amount of um, difficulties, but nevertheless, a, I think, a great film. And then we did uh, a black and white film. Um, I think it was paid for by Central Television, ATV, um, Looks and Smiles, about unemployment in the north of England. And the black and white definitely served served the story. Um, it kind of gave it a pathos. And at that time, I, I shot a, a, a black and white documentary film with the NPR um, about a travelling circus, the Robert, Robert Brothers Circus. I did that with, with collaboration and Nick Gifford. Um, um, that was in black and white, and that was all handheld. Um, I think if you said what's your favourite way of working, it's with the NPR handheld um, and shooting wobbly scope. That's what I love most. Yeah. And um, often in, when you're shooting wobbly scope, because you're doing your own focus pulling, because to have someone hovering on your camera would <clears throat> get in your way, you wouldn't be able to move uh, uh, and catch the action if somebody was hovering over you. So when you were shooting wobbly scope, for me anyhow, I often used to shoot on long lenses, so I was sure about the focus, but the problem about long lenses is setting the whole scene, seeing the whole scene because you're on a tight lens. In John Huston's book, uh, he talks about um, a way of shooting where he talks about three shots in one, so you might start wide with the cowboys coming towards you and then you might pan around and end up on a, a, a mid close-up of a, a character and then you might be motivated to pan back on a tight shot and that's all in one. And he said that's an intelligent way to shoot a film. Um, so that's what I tried to do. Not that I was copying him, but it became obvious that the only way to capture motion uh, and make sure you're in focus is to is to pan and develop the shot so the audience knows where they are if that makes sense yeah and did i mean is there you talk about kind of doing that kind of work in those black and white films is there an obvious difference or are there problems in doing that kind of work in color that is different from doing that kind of work in black and white or is there is that no i think i mean ob obviously black and white stock is faster and the speed, as we talked about before, is absolutely paramount because it means you can shoot without lighting, you can use natural light. So, but I don't think it's different. I just think um, the big issue there is, is, is um, the ASA, in, in my opinion. Yeah. That that's the thing that I've always fought for, yeah. is a good ASA. Um, so, I mean, in... in that kind of 70s period, you're working on different documentaries mm. and you're working obviously with Ken Loach and a number mm. of those and other sort of projects. Mm. Um, what was the relationship between you and Ken Loach? I mean, were you, I mean, was that a good collaboration mm. in terms of your approach to the style of the film, mm. how it looked, the use mm. of colour or black and white, depending on, on the project? It's interesting because Barry Hines, um, uh, Barry Hines's brother, um, talks about our working relationship in his book um, that he wrote recently. He said that we were both uh, a little stubborn, that we were both um, uh, quiet and thoughtful, and he even used the word respect, respectful. So I think we had a really good collaboration. I know that um, that when Ken was going to shoot uh, after a lifetime, he was so desperate that I shot it, he flew all the way over to Ireland where I was working on, on Black Beauty to try and persuade me to do it. Um, 
So, so I think he became, our relationship was very, very important. I didn't end up shooting that film, but we had a very strong relationship. Um, I just think we instinctively, by luck, uh, had the same kind of approach mm. to the work. So we did about 11 films. Yeah. Was there an obvious difference you know, in terms of that relationship between a project like Kez, which you've described as kind of being a response to the script and the, the story being told, and something like Blackjack, which feels like a very different mm. kind of film because it's much more of a kind of period piece than Kez, which is mm. very contemporary. Mm. Did you feel like you changed your style for that, or the film style, um, or was it...? I think um, James Hill had done a... a, a James Hill had done a, a, a lovely film called Josephina, and um, he asked me if I if I would shoot um, Black Beauty, um, and it was in Ireland, and I was available, and I was a freelance technician, so I I jumped at the opportunity. It was a completely different experience. I'm not saying it was an unhappy experience, but the whole, um, it wasn't like working with Arken at all. Um, and of course the style of the lighting and the camera work was, was different to what we were trying to achieve on Kess. Um, James Hill, I had no worries about having movie lights on the set. In fact, if you didn't have movie lights on the set, he was worried that it, it wasn't going to come out. Um, so I would bring large north lights on, onto, the, on, onto the location in, on the set. And of course, north lights uh, can create a beautiful penetrating soft light. Um, and uh, that's kind of how I lit the film. Um, but it, it wasn't, it would never be a collaboration like with Ken Loach and also I wasn't operating and I think for me uh, operating uh, is crucial because not only um, are you looking through a ground glass and you're seeing the exact focus, you're seeing the exact sense of the light, you're also seeing the eyes and the performance and while you're operating between and during takes you understand what coverage might be needed to complete the scene so you're actually ahead of everybody else in in the sense that you're seeing the performance on the ground glass and you're working out uh, what you what you need to cover in fact whether the scene needs any coverage um, so when you're operating, I think you're, uh, you, for me anyhow, you're learning. You're, le you're learning as you shoot. And on Black Beauty, you weren't doing that. You no. had a camera so operator. We had a camera operator on Black Beauty, so the, the experience was different, yeah. very different. Um, what about a film like um, Gumshoe? which was your mm. first with Stephen Frears, um, which is the same sort of time period. Again, yeah. is there a different... Um, Gum, Gumshoe was interesting in as much that it was Stephen's first feature feature. And, uh, um, and he, Stephen was very inexperienced, a little bit scared. Um, we had a wonderful script again by Neville Smith, a great Albert Finney. Um, and as I said earlier, that when you read a script, you have you come to a, a visual chemistry, a visual sense of what the story should be, how it should be seen, and you hope that what you see is what the director might see, and what the actors might see, and what the writer has seen, and that that there are many people making a film, but nevertheless, you have your vision, and that's why you took the job. You didn't take the job about money, you took it because that's something you fancy. Mm -hmm. And what I saw, I saw Gumshoe like the films of the French New Wave. I thought of it as developing shots. 
I thought of it as being uh, that the camera w was a character and, and the camera became a part of the actual story. And, um, and the thing was that it was my naivety in a sense because that's quite tricky to achieve if you want to be at a certain standard of work. And Albert Finney is a brilliant actor, but he, he's best than take one. So we'd be lagging behind and we'd go for take one and we missed some connection in a complicated setup. And then Albert would complain about why, uh, why he has to do it again. Um, so I, all I can say about Gumshoe is that there are gr great things in it, but it was, didn't really quite work. And after that, Stephen went off and got a job with Thames TV um, to learn how to be a director. And uh, he learned, but yeah. he didn't really know when he did come shoot. Yeah. Well, okay. And I certainly didn't know because it was my second or third film. Yeah. I mean, you talk about um, you know, thinking about it in terms of the French New Wave. Were there any, I mean, given the topic of the film, did you think about kind of the classic film noirs of the 40s or the, that, you know, the more kind of, I suppose, well, John Houston wanted to did, talk? And we did talk about that endlessly, and that's what Neville had written. And yes, we, we did quite a lot of studying of different films and different ideas. Um, and um, it's almost instinctively in the script. If you read the script, you know where you're headed. Um, it's a, it's a superb script. I, I don't know if it's any good as a film. Um, so, um, you have that period in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, you've got, you go from F to Kez, you've got Gumshoe, Black Beauty. Um, you then spend quite a lot of the 70s working largely in television. Yes, I did. Um, <coughs> um, I went back to Burma with Adrian Cole in 70, straight after Gumshoe, because I think I must have been a bit pissed off with the cinema business. And um, I went off with Adrian Cole to northern Thailand and we crossed the border into Shan State, Burma, illegally with the SSA army who were fighting for independence. Unfortunately, we were only supposed to be away five months, but um, it, it, it became um, a long journey of uh, a year and a half. And uh, my, youngest, my youngest son was actually born in, in um, Bangkok while I was up in the Burmese jungle. Um, the Shan and the Kumintang uh, declared war on the Shan and the Shan army and the Shan army we spent the whole time running away from the Kumintang with us following them. It was a complete disaster. It was supposed to be about opium and the opium trade and 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 the Wa state and the Shan people and the Iko and the Akka and all these hill people. But it was a year and a half of battle. And um, then I came back and I went on doing documentaries. And did your we talked a little bit about this earlier on, but did your approach, do, do you think you've got a different approach when doing television to film, or is it just the, again, is it just the story or the kind of thing you're trying to... I think it's encounter? always the story. I think what you learn in documentaries about natural light and how, how it works and how, um, uh, you know, how the colours, um, how the colours are, of the spectrum, I'm um, I mean, explaining this badly. When you're shooting documentaries, you're working with natural light, and you start to learn about shadow and and brightness, about different colours, about different reflecting colours. I mean, we we think of light in, in its purity, but in fact, it's 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 what is reflected, and it's the reflected light that's in the important thing if you're a documentary cameraman and you realise that the complexity of reflected light is something that you could uh, in, in capture for in the cinema film. Um, I'm not explaining it well, but, but, but documentaries 
films do, if you're working with natural light, do teach you about lighting, about colour, about contrast, about different reflective values. You never get that chance on a feature film. If you came, if you started as a clapper boy on, or clapper girl on a feature film, and you stayed only shooting features, you would never have the opportunity to, to study light that you do have on a documentary film. And that, that, that's a priceless um, experience. Um, so do you think that experience in the 1970s did it change how you looked at film work as well, you moved into the It just made me confirm what I'd always thought, that cameramen who walk in on the set and black out daylight and then light it are actually crackers. <laughs> um, they, they should embrace and understand what, what, the, what the light is, the, yeah. the real light is. Um, perhaps there's a... We were looking, talking about your your career and there's a moment in the late 70s early 80s where you work I mean you work alongside Peter Shishitsky on The Empire mm. Strikes Back there's a film in New Zealand which I'm forgetting the name of which is kind of That's a big Harley kind of, film yeah um, those feel very different in your um, in your career in terms of the kind of films well I think the film in New Zealand was done for a friend and, uh, and I was able to take my kids with me. Mm. It was during their summer holiday. And um, so that's a, a fair enough reason to go. Um, I only really work on film, films that scripts is what I really like. And the thing about um, Empire Strikes Back is that Peter, it was shot at Elstree Studios, and Peter who's a very experienced um, DP because partly because of the films he's done, but also because he's done, had done so many commercials. He had a, a big vocabulary. He needed somebody who would actually do what he said and not mess him around. So he Im got me employed for four months. And I spent four months basically doing blue screen and working uh, with a Todeo camera and doing plates um, uh, for, for the film. And it was four months of getting to work at 8.30 and going home at six. And um, it was a wonderful learning curve. Um, and also my kids thought I'd finally arrived. <laughs> um, it, they, were be, they were lovely, I mean, I, I knew nothing about blue screen and um, the, the uh, visual effects unit or whatever unit I was on, the, the whole crew were, they knew I was a novice and they, they looked after me, they were wonderful. Yeah. And Peter would come over every now and then and check on what we were doing on our stage and sometimes you'd not like it and sometimes you would love it. And it was just working to his needs. Yeah. Do you think anything from that experience stayed with you for films you I made later? I think um, you learnt about big lamps and lots of lamps and and you learnt a bit about scheduling and about timing and and about visual effects, which they're things that are all useful to know about. Yeah. Um, and, and Peter, I thought, lit the film beautifully. And Irving Kirshner is a wonderful director to work with. Very tolerant, very, I thought, great, great man. Yeah. Um, we were talking earlier a bit about um, Angel, mm. which you must have made in, in uh, that early 80s period, mm. um, and sort of working with Neil Jordan. Mm. It was worth maybe just talking again about it um, on camera. Um, the kind of his approach to colour or the, mm. that film's use of mm. colour. Uh, da David, David Rose, who's commissioning um, producer, David Rose, who's commissioning producer Channel 4, asked me if I would go to Ireland to work with Neil Jordan. Um, he said it, it's a script that was being partly produced by John Borman. And, um, 
and he told, told me roughly what the story was about. And I met um, Neil in Dublin and got on really well with him. And he hadn't the faintest idea how to make a film, but he was a good writer. And as I've said before, the words are the, mo are the most important thing, and the words were pretty amazing. Stephen Ray was pretty amazing. The only thing Neil said is he, he, he would love to explore colour. So I took that cue and, and explored colour. And um, for instance, when on a singing, singing uh, I, I chose a, a, a real restaurant because we had no money that had all these fantastic um, neon signs in it. I went everywhere I went, I went for colour. And, and it w was a small budget Channel 4 film, but it was pretty, pretty good, pretty good experience. Um, so that was a chance for you to kind of explore some of the more absolutely. obvious extreme side of yes. colour yes. rather than the more naturalistic. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I on. suppose the same thing uh, also is slightly where um, uh, Stephen Frears, when I did the... Uh, um, Dirty Pretty Things, to, to, to us that again was about colour and, and it was about vibrant colour on Dirty Pretty Things. I think that's what Stephen wanted. Um, yeah, no, an interesting film for that mm. kind of combination of... And, but my favourite film with Stephen is called Last Summer Made for Thames Television. It's by far my favourite film with Richard Beckinsale. And um, the energy of the light in that film is amazing. And <clears throat> I think it was 76, 1976. And the s there was not one day of the shoot when the sun didn't shine. It was, com London was completely vibrant with light. And it was so exciting to catch it. Normally when you work in London or in Britain, you expect the morning to be maybe sunny in the afternoon cloudy and that won't match or the whole day's raining and that won't look very interesting or it's the you know the, the light is so inconsistent um, and that you're so jealous of people who live in Italy or in America where the sun is vibrant and and there's energy and that's what you want isn't it you want with the photography you want to create energy and what you get is pea soup so, so that film with, is my favourite film that um, I, I, I did with Stephen Frears. Um, I want to move on um, to talk a little bit about the two films you make with Bill Versailles, mm. um, Local Hero and Comfort and Joy. Mm. Um, obviously, when we talk about um, you know the quality of light and the kind of the use of light, I mean, Local Hero is is often talked about in terms of its use of light, particularly sequences towards the end, a lot of it being shot at a sort of magic hour. Mm. Um, I wondered if we could talk through about that kind of collaboration with Bill Forsyth, particularly on Local Hero, but also again on, on Comfort and Joy. Again, about the relationship between you and the director and kind of the what you felt you could bring to those films. Mm. I'm not the person to ask. The person to ask is Bill. Um, um, I, I like Local Hero a lot because I thought it was had a great heart as a story. Um, and Bill is a very funny and kind man. And particularly the um, west coast of Scotland does actually have, uh, during the day the light is can be amazing. And it, it is gentle but it does have energy. And I guess this is DP, what you're searching for is energy in your work. Um, as we were talking earlier about the flatness that light can be quite dour. Um, and I remember from Local Hero, a lovely script, some good actors, some fabulous light and humour and the friendship. Um, one of the kindest directors. Um, it's not often that you work with 
directors you think that are the most kind people. Mm. Bill is truly lovely. And was that a good relationship to take into Comfort and Joy? Which I think... Yes, I mean, Comfort and Joy was different because it was a town film and a lot of it was shot, shot at Magic Car. Perhaps it wasn't quite such a, a successful screenplay, but um, certainly a, a joy to work with, certainly. Um, I was thinking about Paul's earlier point about um, the kind of the blues and the nook and moonlight. Um, mm. Obviously, both films feature nighttime sequences, but Comfort and Joy particularly has a very urban um, colour to mm. it. I think there's a, like, several of the sequences are at night mm. with him driving through the city. Mm. Um, and again, I was thinking that's coming back to what Paul said earlier on. I wondered if you, if you remember whether or not there was a particular sense of trying to capture an urban kind of colour scheme for comfort and joy in a way that perhaps is different from other it feels slightly less naturalistic it feels mm. slightly more um, um, there's a particular kind of mood that perhaps mm. was, was being aimed for um, I, I remember that, 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 that we were quite insistent on, 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 on trying to shoot at the right time with the right quality of light and we made a huge effort to do that um, and on a low budget film that's quite difficult and it wasn't a, a high budget film it's quite difficult to um, in a sort of 35 day shoot to uh, maintain that quality but I know that that's something we fought for um, and I guess if it's the consistency of the low light must have been to dealing with, to do with the grading, I think. Um, Bill, Bill, in this book, he talks about that, uh, our collaboration quite well, um, yeah. if you want to read it. No, that'd be great. I mean, it's, it's, there are two films that I think, I think Comfort and Joy is a bit underrated. Um, underrated? Yeah, mm. I think it's a, it's a nice film, but coming after Gregory's Girl and mm. Local Hero, it tends yeah. to be... It got pushed aside. Um, I love it. Gregory is cool. Um, I suppose with both um, Local Hero and Comfort and Joy, they're also films where you are, you're not camera operators, no, are not, you? No, no. Um, so again, a slightly different yeah. kind of setup. Um, I suppose to, to, to move on right at the end of our period for the project, um, to talk a bit about the killing fields and the mm. mission. Um, and I suppose we were wondering about your experiences on like the Adrian Cowell documentaries, whether those contributed to what you were trying to I'm do. I'm sure. With those. I'm sure. David Putnam wanted me, and therefore Roland wanted me on the Killing Fields because I'd been in Vietnam um, several times and been in Burma and in several times and all over the shop filming real wars, and I guess they thought. I would make sure that the explosions and the visual effects were black and not all sparkly and lovely. Um, and I think, um, for me, emotionally, um, the scenes of Sidney Schoenberg in, in Phnom Penh and <coughs> those scenes were lit by my, my, my experience. So I suppose. I was copying what I'd seen in in war zones. Um, having said that, there's some amazing operating. There's some amazing visual effects, special effects, and acting. and And Roland was no fool. He 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 made those films. They're his films. I mean, of course, uh, Bruce Robinson wrote the screenplay, and he did a fine job too. Um, and the mission, I suppose, the, the, the sense of working with Orlando and Claudio Villas-Boas in the Shingu is, is the light of the mission. But again, Stuart Craig did such a wonderful job and Cartagena was so amazing and the actors were so amazing and again Roland did a good job. My only thought about the film is that somehow the script was not quite clear where it was headed. Um, so one hesitates about saying it's a great film, but but um, 
it was a, certainly a very r rich film. Yeah. Did you feel... We used ag for colour a lot. Mm. Um, I seem to remember um, using ag for, uh, for a lot of the uh, interiors. Um, to try to get this, the, the feeling of the difference because when you're uh, um, in, in, in a tropical area outside the feeling of the humidity and the light is so different than when you're inside and, and I used Agfa to try and make the separation between the inside and the outside. Was there a Given there's more, there's faster film stocks available. There's that slightly, time, does slightly that... faster, and um, and <coughs> and to to my eye, to to my to my eye is slightly um, uh, the the outfit was slightly softer. I'll use the word softer. The tones were not quite so brittle, um, and and you know. DPs, they'll try any trick to do something different. They don't want to get caught in the same old scenario. I mean, I, I gave up shooting to, to direct a world apart because I thought, um, I thought I was repeating myself. Um, that was after the mission. I just thought, well, I'm going to repeat myself again. No thanks, let's go and direct something. And Peter P. shot uh, a world apart which turned out great and it was about something important and a good script. Um, so that is the danger if you're a DP is that you're going to end up going around in circles. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Throw something in the works. Yeah. Um, I mean, is that why it's useful to... I mean, I was thinking, you know, you go from local hero and comfort and joy kind of you know, say low budget quite small shoots to something like mm. the mission or the killing fields is that is there a deliberate attempt to try and change yeah but also to learn and and um, one one of the films i love the most is uh, made in britain with tim roth alan clark to me was a genius of a director and um, um and that happened just almost just uh when when uh, uh, when we were when we were sh just before um, we shot a, a world apart, um, I, I worked with Alan and Tim Roth on Made in Britain, and to me that was a joy because it was all steady cam and I was completely free. Um, the my camera it wasn't up to me; it was my camera had a relationship with Tim Roth, I'm sure, and uh, I just followed the steady cam. And that was so exciting, exhilarating, and and I just used fluorescence and let them the tubes burn the image, and uh, I I didn't mind if things were overexposed or grainy or whatever. I just wanted to catch the performance of Tim. Yeah, that's good. And, and the chance to work on uh, with Alan Clark. Made in Britain was like a big fresh air in in becoming. To, 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 in a way, to I found it liberating because otherwise you might get set doing something always the same way. Mm. And do you think your again your experience in documentary helps with something like Made in Britain or Sense of Freedom or um, Babylon? You know those kind of very contemporary British films. Mm -hmm. But they seem to have a very, I mean, to us, it's got that kind of very kind of documentary mm. aesthetic to it. So your experience would help sort of shape that? I'm sure you're right. Um, I don't know if it's desirable, but I'm sure you're right. I'm sure uh, the world and action background permeates through, throughout the work I've done. And um, I'm sure I've never done a better film than Kess. And that's the first film, and I'm sure I've never shot a better documentary than uh, some of the Walden actions. Um, and the really good films I've worked on—they're really the good scripts and the good directors. 
Um, you can't work in a vacuum, it is a team. Mm -hmm. And um, and new ideas are the thing that make it work. Yeah. Cool. So, across your career, you talked about kind of making, trying to kind of challenge yourself, try new things. What role would something like a new film stock or a different film stock play? How, how would you make those decisions about, I'm going to try Agfa now rather than Eastman? What would be your, what would be the motivating reason to do that? Um, I think it's the same. Um, when uh, Steadicam, I read about Steadicam for the first time, I thought this is something that might be interesting to explore, that might, that might be exciting. What I found with the Steadicam on Alan Clark's film Made in Britain, that the Steadicam actually had a relationship with Tim Roth, the actor. And in a way, they dictated what, and I followed behind. And I think um, on um, the mission, I desperately wanted to find a way that the interiors on the mission had a different quality to the exteriors. From my experience of being in, in the Amazon, um, the, the, the exterior light is so different from being inside in terms of smell, atmosphere, um, I wanted to find a way to express that, so I looked for how I could do that, and I, I, I um, thought Agfa would be an, an interesting way to try and um, give, give, find a way of showing the difference between life inside and life outside. I'm not explaining it well. No, I think I understand. I, um, Nobody there, else will. Are there any other examples? I mean, we talked about the, the flashing the negatives sort of case. Are there other things you've tried with film stock, um, such as that, to try and get a very particular look? Well, obviously, uh, in 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 um, in documentaries, I've used a, a huge amount of chem tone. Um, so, with chem tone, Eastman colour, and a point nine. For, 0.95 orange in you, you can almost film anything. So I could jump in the police car or be on a, on a fire engine rushing through the streets and ca catch the action without any lights whatsoever. So that's what, what we're trying to make in a documentary centre is to be as free as possible, um, to be handheld, to be doing your own focus, to be finding your own rhythm with the people you're photographing. Um, so Chemtone is a good example of how that uh, made that more possible. Yeah. Cool. Um, I suppose finally, is there anything else about kind of colour or kind of film, Eastman colour that, you know, you've thought of while we've been talking or anything just you, that could, might be relevant, you know, just before we finish up? Well, what, what, what we did, um, uh, what I did on the films with, um, <coughs> with uh, Technicolor and with Denim Labs, I, I had a special clapperboard put up and on the clapperboard we would have a, a colour chart of, um, of different numbers. Um, so we would talk on the, on the slate, we would talk about density and we would talk about the, the tones we wanted plus yellow, plus green, plus, you know, and so we, we would try to make as clear as possible to the lab exactly what we were trying to achieve as a starting point. And then, of course, we did huge, a lot of tests um, to make sure that we understood. Uh, what colours we were trying to achieve. So I think lab lab testing was in those days was incredibly important um, to to have a very precise and clear way of uh, for the rushes to look. Because the, what would happen is if you if you didn't control the way that rushes were printed, and if you left it just to the lab. Um, 
you could find yourself presenting rushes that um, were not acceptable to you and what you're trying to achieve as a DP is your vision of the story. You have to find a way of that the rushes represent that. If, if, they're, um, if they don't, then you're going to find that you may well run into trouble with the producer or the director or whatever. You've got to be in control. You have to control the way your film looks. If you just have to do it, I don't know how to put it in any other way, but you do. Yeah. No, that's great. I think this is a really important point. It's not coherent, though. No. I think it is. Um, let me try again. I think that the important thing with, with the lab and the contact at the lab is that you are very precise with what tone, what colour, what density you want the print the visual effects you're trying to achieve. You have to find a way with exhaustive testing of um, producing what you want to produce. 